Okay, let's go straight ahead. Um, so, uh, our last talk is by Ming Hao Quick, who will speak about, well, title around the motivic monodromy conjecture for non degenerate hypersurfaces. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, so, I'm a fifth year student, fifth year graduate student at Brown University. Uh, and today, my title of the so, so the title of my talk is around the motivate monodromy conjecture for non-degenerate hypersurfaces. So this is the main theorem that I proved recently. So the, the motivate monodromy conjecture holds for non-degenerate polynomials uh, in n equals to three variables. So here, all my polynomials are uh, complex coefficients. Um, and a remark is the conjecture is already known for all polynomials, for, uh, all, for, for all polynomials in two variables. Uh, this is due to multiple people. And the, the outline of my talk is, first I'll introduce what it means for a polynomial to be non-degenerate. Uh, and then I'll introduce the statement of this conjecture. And then finally, I'll motivate the proof of my, so, so the proof of this theorem uh, via an example. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. Ming, please, please zoom out the screen. I'm only oh, seeing sorry. part of the screen. I maximize the screen because I could see it. Okay. Yeah. Can you yeah. see this? Good. Thank okay. you. Sorry. For yeah. that. Okay. So before I move on, I want to say uh, this theorem was already known before, uh, but these people kind of use some roundabout methods, and my proof is actually geometric. Uh, geometric proof. So, so now I'll begin. So first I'll introduce what it means for a polynomial to be non-degenerate. So first fix a complex polynomial uh, such that uh, it vanishes at, at the zero point. Uh, and, 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 and we'll write the polynomial like this. And then the first object we're interested in is the Newton polyhedron of F. So this is the Newton polyhedron of F. Uh, we'll define it as follows. First, you look at all the vectors in NN such that the corresponding coefficient in F is non-zero. So, so, so you take that vector A and, and you add this upper half space, and then you take the union of all these things. And then lastly, you take the convex half. So this sits in this upper half space. So let me first use an example to explain this definition. So first consider this polynomial here. A uh, polynomial in two variables. Uh, as you can see, I've drawn the Newton polyhedron below. So here is how it goes. So this point you see here, it's x1 to the power of 4. Uh, this point is x1 square uh, x2. This point is x1 x2 cube. And finally, this point is x1 cube uh, x2 square. So these are precisely all the monomials that are appearing in F. So what I do is I add an upper half space to this point. So this is how it looks. So this is the union of all these upper half spaces. And then finally, I take the convex half of this red portion. So what I end up with is precisely this non-compact polyhedron. So this is precisely the Newton polyhedron of F. So that's the definition uh, of, of the Newton polyhedron of F. Now I want to explain what it means for a polynomial to be non-degenerate. So what it means is first, let's consider, let's focus on each phase of the Newton polyhedron. So if bar sigma is a phase of the Newton polyhedron, then we'll then th then we shall consider uh, the part of F uh, that's sitting on the phase. So these are precisely all the monomials uh, such that the corresponding vector A is sitting on the face, var sigma. So this is the var sigma part of F. And we say that F is non-degenerate if for every phase var sigma, uh, the, the, the vanishing locus of this var sigma part of F uh, is non-singular in the torus GMN contained in AN. So this sits in AN. So that, this, that's what it means for F to be non-degenerate. Uh, and the fact is almost all polynomials are non-degenerate. So if you pick any generic polynomial, it's going to be non-degenerate. So this was one example 
this this is one example of a non-degenerate polynomial. So what it means to be non-degenerate is for every phase you have to check the condition. So for example, if I pick this phase, uh, I have to check that x1 times x2 cubed plus x1 squared times x2. The vanishing locus of this is non-singular in the torus gm squared. So in fact, is this 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 polynomial here is non-degenerate. So you have to check every phase, including this vertex and including the whole Newton polynomial. And 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 another example, which will be the main example for today. Uh, so this is a polynomial in three variables. Uh, and then likewise, similarly, you we'll plot the point. So x one square, x one times x two to the power four, x two cubed times x three, and x three cubed. Uh, you add the upper half space, space to each point, and then you take the union of that, and, it, and then you take the convex hull. So what we end up with is a Newton polyhedron that's sitting above uh, these six facets, right? Uh, so three of these facets are standard coordinate planes, uh, and we have three facets that are not lying in any coordinate planes. So, so the fact is this is also non-degenerate. Uh, so now I'll introduce an equivalent characterization for what it means to be, so equivalent characterization for what, what it means for a polynomial to be non-degenerate. So in fact, there's a cleaner way of expressing when F is non-degenerate uh, in terms of the normal pan uh, of this Newton polyhedron of F. So let me define what, it, um, so let me define what, what this normal pan is. So first you start from, this Newton polyhedron, uh, and then the normal fan satisfies this following properties. So it satisfies the property where uh, k-dimensional phases uh, of the Newton polyhedron of F uh, is 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 in in a one-to-one -one correspondence with n minus k-dimensional. Uh, so n minus one. N minus k dimensional uh, cones in this fan, and so in the fan uh, sigma f. So here in this example, n is equal to three because f is three variables. Uh, and then in particular, if I take k to be uh, if I take k to be two dimensional, I I I get the facets. So the facets of the Newton polyhedron of f. Uh, and what this correspondence says is the facets of the Newton polyhedron of F uh, should correspond to the rays in sigma of F. So what do I mean by rays? I mean one-dimensional cones. So for example, uh, if you look at this example, uh, I've drawn the normal fan on the right-hand side, or rather a cross-section of the normal fan. So this is roughly how it looks like. Uh, and if you focus on this facet, uh, this facet has a normal vector, right? It, it, so, so, so it's a fine span has a normal vector. And that normal vector is precisely this ray that we see here, this ray U1. And then likewise, if I call the normal vector uh, for, for, for this facet to be U2, I get this ray U2. And then likewise, this, this facet here has a corresponding ray not by u3. And then how do I recover the, the, the other cones in sigma, sigma f? So for example, if I look at this face of the Newton polyhedron of f, uh, this face actually corresponds to this maximal cone uh, of, 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 of the normal fan. So how you see this is, uh, observe that this face is contained in four facets. Uh, so its corresponding cone would be precisely generated by the rays uh, corresponding to these four facets. So that's how you define the normal fan of F. And then now I now 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 I shall introduce the equivalent characterization for a polynomial to be non-degenerate. So first, notice that sigma of F is a subdivision of the upper half. Uh, of, of, of the upper half space. So for example, in this example, it's, it's a subdivision of the upper half space. Uh, so by toric geometry, you know that it's associated toric variety uh, admits a proper birational morphism to AN. 
like this. Uh, but this, this toric variety here is usually singular. So uh, what Cox did is uh, this, toric, this toric variety has a quotient construction, for example, given, given by something like this. So some GIT quotient. Uh, and then by Cox construction, uh, there's a canonical smooth step that's sitting above this toric variety, uh, which I shall denote uh, script X sigma F. So it's nothing but just the stack portion of what you see on the left-hand side. Uh, so by Cox construction, there's a smooth stack. This is smooth because this space is smooth. Uh, there's a smooth stack that's sitting above this toric variety uh, whose good modelized space is precisely this toric variety. Uh, and, and we'll let um, pi sigma F denote this composition. Uh, so from here to here, and then finally to AN. And then here comes the equivalent characterization. Uh, this is recently observed by me and my advisor. So the following are equivalent for F, for, for complex polynomial F. Uh, F is non-degenerate if and only if this morphism uh, is what we call a stacky embedded resolution of the vanishing locus of F. So what, what I mean by Stacky embedded desingularities, uh, stacky embedded resolution of the vanishing locus of F is just this condition that uh, the pre image of D of F under the morphism uh, is a SNC divisor. It's a SNC divisor on the stack uh, script X sigma F. So this is this is one one neat way of characterization of 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 classifying when F is non-degenerate. And now, now, now I shall introduce the statement of the motivic monogamy conjecture. So two objects of interest when one studies the singularity of the vanishing locus of F uh, at this point zero uh, are the following objects. So the first is what people call the local motivic monogamy so, so the local motivic zeta function uh, denoted like this. So it's some zeta function uh, that, that is known to specialize to other zeta functions. For example, the periodic zeta function. Uh, and then the second object is some eigenvalues of uh, a, a monodromy action on a singular cohomology uh, of the Milner fiber of F. So this is some geometric object associated to F, which I have no time to cover today. So today my main focus will be part one, this, this object only. So, so let me state the conjecture first. So the conjecture says that uh, for every neighborhood U of the origin in CN, uh, we have these two objects. So the pose of the motivic zeta function, which is part one, and then we have the monogamy eigenvalues of F at points uh, in this open neighborhood intersect the vanishing locus of F. And the conjecture predicts a relationship between these two objects. So it says that the relationship is precisely given by this exponential map. So this, this is what our conjecture says. It says that uh, given any pole, if I apply the exponential map, I precisely get a monotomy eigenvalue. So one thing I should mention here first is that this, this as, as the name suggests, this, this is a zeta function. Uh, it, it, it looks like what, what you expect from a zeta function, but not only that, it's known that this zeta function is a rational function. Uh, so once you have a rational function, you can study its poles. Uh, and moreover, one can compute a set of the candidate poles, some candidate poles for this motivic zeta function uh, using an embedded resolution of the vanishing locus of that. So what I mean by candidate poles is some, some of the poles in this set could be fake. So some of the poles in this set uh, could be fake poles, so not actual poles. Uh, and what makes the conjecture so difficult is uh, what people usually do is you will take an embedded resolution of the vanishing locus of F, produce a set of candidate poles, uh, but it turns out that not every candidate pole uh, induces a monotomy eigenvalue. 
So that's where uh, the difficulty of the conjecture lies. So now I shall talk about the conjecture in the setting of non-degenerate polynomials through this example that we have been discussing all along. So first from earlier, we have this stacky embedded resolution uh, of V of F, right? So using this stacky resolution of V of F, uh, it's known that uh, it's known that using this resolution, one can write down a set of candidate posts for the motivic zeta function of F as follows. So one would draw, first draw its Newton polyhedron like this, look at all the facets that are not contained in a coordinate hyperplane. So in this example, there are three facets not contained in a coordinate, in, not contained in a coordinate hyperplane. So these are three facets. And for each facet, for example, this facet, I'll, I'll write down its equation like this. And using this equation, one can write down a corresponding pole as follows. One would first sum up the coordinates of the normal vector. So nine plus four plus six. Five and minutes. Then, okay. Thank you. And then one would divide by this, this number that you see on the right-hand side, 18, uh, and then include a minus sign. So this is how you produce a candidate pole uh, from this facet of the Newton polyhedron. And, and then likewise, for the other facets, you could write down a corresponding candidate pole. So for example, for this, one would sum up the coordinates again of the normal vector and then divide it by eight. So this is minus 10 over eight which is minus five over four. And this is one of the candidate posts that I've listed below. And then likewise for this, one would once again sum them up uh, and then divide it by one. So this is minus two and it's what you see here. So using these three numbers, one, one gets a set of candidate posts by just union it with minus one. So once you union it with minus one, uh, this set is a set of candidate posts. So arising, from the stacky resolution that I've written earlier. Uh, but actually it turns out that this candidate pole uh, does not induce a monodromy eigenvalue of them uh, near zero. So using, this so using this resolution is not enough to show the monodromy conjecture. Uh, but fortunately, uh, the set of poles, so, so the set of actual poles of this motivic zeta function uh, turns out to be just this number. So minus one and minus 19 over 18. And if you recall, minus 19 over 18 corresponds to this facet here. So in some way, it's saying that these two facets that you see here uh, are inducing fake poles of the motivic zeta function. So one could ask, this is the key question of, of, of my talk, can one possibly construct uh, an embedded resolution of the vanishing locus of F uh, that use precisely this set of poles, but 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 does not see this 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 two fake poles uh, induced by these two facets. So this is part of my ongoing work. So the answer is yes for this example. So here is the strategy for my work. Uh, so so this is the strategy I've undertaken to prove whatever theorem that I have in mind. So. One starts from the Newton polyhedron of F, uh, and then you drop the two bad facets, right? So these two facets induces fake poles, so you drop them. So what I mean by drop is you consider the remaining facets. Uh, each remaining facet ha uh, cuts out an upper half space, and you take the intersection of the remaining upper half of, of, of these four remaining half upper half spaces. So if you take the intersection of, thank you. If if you take the if you take the intersection of the remaining four upper half spaces, uh, you end up with this Newton this this new polyhedron. So we just went from this polyhedron to this new polyhedron, uh, and then using this new poly this this new polyhedron, one can associate a normal fan as before. And then using this normal fan, uh, likewise, there's a toric variety. Uh, that toric variety uh, admits a proper birational map to A3. And then likewise, there's a canonical smooth Artin stack sitting above this toric stack. And likewise, you consider this composition. And the main claim is uh, this map that you see here, 
uh, induced by this new normal fan and this new collision uh, is actually a stacky embedded resolution of the vanishing locus of that. And not just that, using this embedded resolution, it computes precisely the set of poles uh, of the motivic zeta function. Okay, and that's, 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 that's the end of my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for a nice talk. <laughs>